So friends, welcome to this next Ventures course. I am um, delighted that you're joining us for this introduction to Afrofuturism. We have one more course yet this semester that I hope you'll also check out by going to mcpherson.edu slash ventures, because that also promises to be a good course with Tim McAwee. But for now, without any further ado, I want to introduce Dr. Tyler to you. Dr. Tamisha Tyler has been a visiting professor of theology and culture and theopia Theopoetics at Bethany Theological Seminary in Richmond, Indiana, which many of you know exactly where that is. But if you saw the recent Newsline article from March 29th, you would also know that Dr. Tyler has just been appointed to a full-time teaching faculty position at Bethany Theological Seminary, beginning her new position and directing the MA program beginning July 1st. So Dr. Tyler's research interests include theopoetics, theology and the arts, Afrofuturism, Black popular culture, and science fiction. Her dissertation, which was Articulating Sensibilities, Methodologies and Theopoetics in Conversation with Octavia E. Butler, explores Butler's work in the parable series as an embodied artistic and theopoetic response to the theological, economic, and ecological upheaval in Butler's dystopian world. Tamisha is part of the Level Ground Artistic Collective in Los Angeles, California, and her work can be seen in Feminism in Religions blog and Fuller magazine. Her latest project explores religion in the literacy world of Octavia Butler. And so, uh, Tamisha, I know that doesn't capture all of you. I have really enjoyed getting to know you in the time that we've been preparing for this course. And so I can assure the rest of you, this is going to be fun. And I'd like you to welcome Tamisha. And I'm just going to turn it over to you. Oh, thank you so much. Hello, everyone. It's so good to see you, see your faces. We are going to have a lot of fun in the couple of hours we have tonight. Um, I would like to start, I think we're going to start with introductions. Um, so if someone, a couple people wants to, their name, where they're from, or where they're calling in from, and why did you decide to take a class on Afrofuturism and theology, of all things? So two to three people would be great. Well, my name is Joan Houston. I'm from Elizabethtown, PA, and I heard, first heard that term about a year ago from a friend and then saw a, oh, a simulcast or a, a, a streaming of a Metropolitan Opera X and heard Afrofuturism there and it just piqued my interest. Very cool. Welcome, Joan. Who's next? My name is Annalisa Gross, and I'm a Bethany grad, and it's nice to meet you in person, Tamisha, in person. And I've read all of Octavia Butler and listened to, like, the new podcast that Adrienne Marie Brown has done about analyzing it. And so I just, I love the topic. I love this kind of creativity. I'm really moved by it, and I'm so excited that you are bringing that to the Church of the Brethren world. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Yeah, Adrienne Marie Brown, that... Uh... Is it not the How to Survive the End of the World, but it's the um, the Octavius Parables one with Toshi Ray? Yeah, I've listened okay. to both of them, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, very cool. Really, really great. I'll have a story about that probably later at the break, but yeah. Pretty cool. Welcome, Anna. How about one more? So uh, my name is Tom August, and I'm calling in from Baltimore, Maryland. And I'm coming to you uh, because I took uh, Dr. Uh, Swisher's course on uh on the black panther and i think it's important to listen to different voices and so that's why i'm here tonight yeah welcome tom we have a lot of students that come to the afrofuturism class from that science fiction class uh dr schweitzer is uh a much bigger sci-fi nerd than i am and that's saying a lot and i'm really glad that <laughs> randomly i did not expect that uh going into an interview with the dean and then you start talking about science fiction and then you see his eyes light up and I'm like, oh, they do exist. So good times, good times. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and start to share my screen um, and then I'll explain how we're gonna get into it. Um, just as I am beginning to share, just so you know, 
Um, the number one rule in my course is that you do not forsake the brilliance in the room. So that means that you have something to bring. Oh, wait, where did it go? Uh, is it showing the slides as? No. Slides not up yet, but it may take a little bit of time. Okay, I'll keep stalling. I mean, I'm talking. Um, so, <laughs> part of, <laughs> so part of what that means is that your questions, your experiences, the things that you're wondering about is important in this course. Um, here I am, there I am. That That is important in this course. It also means that in my classes, you work. So I don't always lecture for long periods of times in my classes. I bring frameworks, I give you the tools and the frameworks and a little bit of the histories, and then you dig into it as the theologians that you are. So by joining this class for these two hours, you are theologians, whether you believe it or not, you are. So think theologically about the things that we're discussing, ask good questions. There's no such thing as a stupid question. Um, this is the space where you can experiment and ask and think and wander and dream. Um, just so we get a chance to uh, know what's happening. So we did our introductions. We're going to talk about uh, both what is Afrofuturism and some of the themes in Afrofuturism. So we're gonna look at some artifacts together and some clips. We're gonna look at some quotes. Um, we're going to share a little bit about what we think Afrofuturism is. We'll have a discussion. So as I am sharing about the different things and stuff, think about the questions that you, that you have. Um, because of the way the slides are, we're going to hold discussion um, until we get to the discussion part after I go through the themes because it's, going to be harder for me to see you and I would like to see you when we're having the conversation. Um, so we're going to do that and then we're going to take a break. And then for the second half, we are going to get into the theological themes. And so this is going to be um, more interactive, us asking theological questions, thinking about some of these themes, thinking about where that lands, both in your own theological context, but also in your greater questions about the divine. And then um, if we have time, which I believe we will have, We'll have some time to play a little world building game, which I do in all of my classes. And I'll tell you about that when we get to that portion. All right, everybody's ready, buckled in, ready to go. I can't see you, I'm assuming you're nodding. So I'm just gonna keep going. <laughs> so what is Afrofuturism? So many people have heard the term Afrofuturism, especially with the, what was that, 2018 release of Black Panther. The term Afrofuturism kind of exploded on the world stage and everybody is asking, what is Afrofuturism? What is Afrofuturism? What is Afrofuturism? Um, the, one of the most common definitions about Afrofuturism is thinking about the lens and the space where Black people are a part of a future that is centered and thriving. And the understanding that there are Black people in the future. We're going to come back to that idea of there are Black people in the future in a little bit. Um, it represents a lot of the technology, right? Science fiction, a lot of the technological advancements, uh, art, music, visual art, all of these different things. But it also represents, um, as we will see in the next couple of quotes, a philosophy, a way of thinking, a way of being, a way of posturing yourself. And what I have um, discovered as a person who is a Butler lover and got into Afrofuturism through Butler and through a lot of different musicians is that it is also a religious posture. It is a posture that has a lot of different religion and theological themes. So let's take a look at a couple of quotations and then we will go into some of the themes of Afrofuturism and get into some of those as well. So Yatasha Womack, who is a uh, Afrofuturist and she is known for writing the textbook um, Afrofuturism, the textbooks on Afrofuturism, she writes that Afrofuturism is an intersection of imagination, technology, the future, and liberation. And this is the key. It is both an artistic aesthetic and a framework for cultural theory. So a lot of the times that what we encounter in popular culture is the artistic aesthetic. So we encounter a lot of the artifacts that represent Afrofuturism. But as a framework for a cultural theory, it postures us to answer certain questions about the role of particularly African-Americans and where they are in the future and why that question is important. And we're going to get to that when we talk about the concept of time as one of the themes. Um, 
I see people looking and writing, so I'm going to pause. Okay. The next is by a multimedia artist and filmmaker, Colleen Smith. And they say, put simply, I would describe Afrofuturism as the experience of cognitive estrangement as manifested through sound, image, language, and form that so often defines or frames the mundane conditions of movement of generative thought in the African diaspora. It is not the moniker of identity or geography, but a musical, literary, and art historical movement. I think what Smith has here is just so beautiful and beautifully captures the understanding of this cognitive estrangement of what it means to be Black in America, this understanding that frames the mundane conditions and the generative thought of what is happening in the African diaspora. And also, it's not only this identity, but it's also this musical, literary, and it's this movement. So it's not only the idea of the thing that people make, but it's the way in which they move through the world. And the products of that is um, a representation of that, but it is not where the thing is placed. It is not, Afrofuturism isn't only the artifacts. The artifacts come from a certain mindset and that mindset is Afrofuturism. Palsy. Also, if you are a person that forgets your questions and you don't have something to write them down in, you can put them in the chat. I won't look at the chat, but I will look at it during the discussion. So if that's another way for you to think through your questions, I'm happy to do that as well. So themes of Afrofuturism. So these are not exhaustive themes in Afrofuturism. There are many other themes in Afrofuturism, including um, notion of water and fluidity and um, all of these other different things. But these are the ones that I've seen consistently as, it, as I look through different kinds of artifacts and, and, and thought and expressions. So their imagination and world building, black liberation, technology, time, space, and the reclamation of culture or alternative futures. So let's get to the first one. Imagination, and I'm gonna move myself. You know what that says, imagination and world building. So as we're thinking about a space where African-Americans or Black people are thriving in the future. So much of that comes from this understanding of the imagination and of creating a world. What does the world look like where Black people are centered and thriving? What does that world look like? And so much of how we think about this aspect of world building comes from science fiction. Science fiction was one of the first artifacts that uh, people really connect it to Afrofuturism. This is both uh, in literature and also in comics as well. Um, part of this sense and this understanding is how not only how you build worlds where Black people are centered and thriving, but it's about the imagination of Black artists and Black creatives and how the worlds that they build are centered and thriving. So what we have here is not necessarily um, the former, but it's the latter. So these are artists who have created unique and, and intricate worlds. And it's about Afrofuturism that creates a space for them to be unapologetically themselves. So at the bottom right here, can I point? I'm pointing the wrong way. Here, I'm going to point this way so that way everything's mirrored. Uh, <laughs> you have Parliament of Funkadelic. Music is actually such a huge part of Afrofuturism. Parliament of Funkadelic has created their own sense of aesthetic on stage, they're using, um, as you can see in a lot of their costuming, um, really big pieces that incorporates both um, historical or ancient African tradition and culture, but then also this sense of future and space. Um, there's even, um, they would perform with a huge mothership. Has anyone been to, I can't see you all, but has anyone been to the African American Museum in the Smithsonian in DC? Okay, if you go I'm to that museum- three or four hands. Okay, great. If you go to that museum, what you will see in the, on the music floor, which is the top floor of the museum, is you'll see this huge mothership. It's actually pretty big. And that's what they would perform on stage. So the idea and the incorporation of building this world that, that incorporated space travel um, was really important and central to, um, to the beginnings of Afrofuturism. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. So the idea that creating a world where there's this expansive space where Black people existed um, 
definitely centered in Afrofuturism. On the upper right, crap. On the upper right, I have to point the opposite way. On the upper right, <laughs> Well, the left corner for me um, is John Jennings. So John Jennings is an illustrator and an artist, and he is a part of a group with a friend, um, Damian Duffy, and they are a group, and their group name is R2J2. Um, as you can guess, they're both sci-fi nerds. And they are known for creating the graphic novels for Parable of the Sower and Kindred, which are two novels by Octavia Butler. They actually won one of the top awards at Comic-Con for the graphic novel adaptation of Kindred. And Jennings is also really influential in the comic book space. He has created um, an African-American Comic-Con that happens here in Los Angeles at the California African-American Museum. So it's called CAM-Con, because the museum is called CAM, where um, artists from all over the country and probably the world, they come, they share, uh, they're independent publishers for comics. They have conversations with really big names like Ryan Coogler came last year to talk about Black Panther 2. Um, he's created all these different spaces and he's working with different artists and different creatives to try to create um, more diversity in the comic book space. So he is a huge kind of influence in the comic book world of world building. And lastly, just above me, that was easy to point to because of if it was pointing down, I'd be really freaked out. Um, just above me is uh, N.K. Jemison. So we're going to look a little closer to N.K. Jemison. I did want you to mark this series, though. This series, the uh, Broken Earth Trilogy, is the only series in the history of the Hugo Award to win for the whole trilogy. And she's the only science fiction author to win three consecutive times in a row for this trilogy. It is the only trilogy that has done that. And that's for all science fiction. So it's an incredible, incredible series. I highly recommend it. You are sucked in from the first chapter. I cannot say more about N.K. Jemisin, but I will. So N.K. Jemisin is <laughs> like usually acclaimed sci-fi author. She just recently won the MacArthur Genius Grant. Um, she is right in the line in the history of Octavia Butler and Samuel Delaney and others who began and started in the science fiction genre. She's mostly noted for her world building. Um, and she has just such a prolific way of creating whole new spaces and worlds. And a lot of these things are not necessarily based only on African-American or African diaspora characters, but because she creates such interesting world and she herself is African-American, um, it shows the aspect of her creating more spaces for other African-Americans to create um, and to world build. So How Long to Block Future Month is a collection of short stories that obviously won the New York Times bestseller and has some incredible pieces in it. Um, also, this one that's right behind me, The City We Became, is her latest. If you've ever been to New York, if you love New York, if you would like to go to New York, I highly recommend this piece. I'm going to point the other way. Highly recommend this piece. Uh, this piece actually does a really good job of creating world building within our particular world and addressing certain notions of like, racism, economic strife, um, diversity, and all of those things within, within a world building, within a um, multi-universal kind of science-y way. So this story is about cities that actually come to life. So in this world, cities are birthed and they come to life, depending on how how many people are there. And so they come to life through a human avatar. And so this is the story of New York being born. And the antagonist in this story is called the enemy. And it is an entity that wants to snuff out cities from being born. And that person, that entity also has a human avatar. And the way that that human avatar has attached itself to certain political and economic things happening in the city and the way that the human avatars, there's a human avatar for the city of New York, but then there's avatars for each of the boroughs have to fight both on the front of, in our world, right? So like all of the different political economic things, but also they have to fight in this spiritual world of the city trying to be born. It's very, very interesting. And it addresses a lot of the things that are happening in our world in a very new and interesting way. So I highly recommend um, her work. And it's a really great example of the idea of world building and what 
people from different perspectives, particularly African-Americans, can bring to that world. Secondly is, I could move myself, but that's funnier, um, Black liberation. So because Afrofuturism is about a future where Black people are centered and thriving, you cannot talk about Afrofuturism without talking about Black liberation. And that is because in the history of this country, there has always been opposition to Black thriving. There has always been systematic um, negation of Black life. There has been legal and spiritual and scientific justification of denying Black people humanity. And so any kind of stretch of, I am going to exist past today, unfortunately becomes a political act. It should not be. But because of the atrocities that we see, it is. And so part of what we see in this understanding of like Black liberation is this notion that there are these ties to what we're fighting for in the future, but then there is the reality of how we fight to get there. So as an example, this book here, um, Blake or Huts of America is considered one of the first science fiction, one of the first Afrofuturistic writings. It was written in 1859 um, by Martin R. Delaney, and it is actually about a slave revolt. And so Delaney is dreaming and imagining his own sense of fighting for his freedom as a speculative act. And so even the beginnings and the notions of Afrofuturism begins with the sense of fighting for freedom. Um, another early piece would be The Comet by W.B. Du Bois. It is a short story that um, is about a Black man who there is a bombing in his city where he works. And he's walking around and everything is, no one is there. And now he begins to imagine the kind of freedom life that he will have. And he, upon his exploration, runs into a, a white woman. And they have, they end up living in this cave together for a short period of time. And the thoughts between them of who can I be now that the world as we know it are, is gone is radical, right? We can actually live a life together because the ideas of the world are gone. And I mean, it's giving it away. We should still read it. Um, what end up, ends up happening is as soon as they kind of make this declaration, her family finds her and they discover that it was only New York that was destroyed and not the rest of the world. And so the imposition, the racial implications are immediately reinstated because the, the man in the story is, is accused of attempting to rape her or harm her. And she has to say, no, he saved my life. But the assumptions are immediately reinstated. And so it is a glimpse into, for Du Bois, it is a glimpse into the possibilities of if this world were gone, how could we live? But also the realities of, even in an extreme circumstance like this, when we've lost everything, this notion of hierarchy is still immediately reinstated. Um, and so a lot of the works that you'll see in Afrofuturism um, are either directly addressing the notion of the histories of atrocities done to African-Americans, or it does what I call shifting the absurd. So for a piece that is just about black joy, or people doing whatever they want. Hmm. I'm trying to think of a really good example of this. Um, and I can't think of one right now, but I'm just going to think about it theoretically and you can think about it artificial artifacts. So imagine a piece where people are being joyful, being unapologetically themselves and the amount of pushback that piece will get from, actually, I can't think of one. So Beyonce released a new album right? Cowboy Carter. And she says herself, it's not a country album, but it's a Beyonce album that obviously has country influences. And she's getting all of this pushback about how dare does she try to come over into the realms of country. What is actually happening is that people are starting to say, well, historically, country music was actually created by African-Americans. And so by 
this is a loose example, but by Beyonce being un unapologetically herself and reclaiming something that is a part of her history, she is shifting the absurd because there is a group of people that say you can't come into this space without actually knowing the history of who created that space. And also, why are you, why can't she come into this space? What are you saying about this country space that she doesn't belong, right? So do you see the shift in the absurd, right? The person is saying she's absurd, but in reality, they're actually protecting an idea of something that doesn't exist um, and that actually has never existed. And so in that sense, and in, in that space of teaching is also the space of, I think, liberation. You have here right above me, um, the ways in which protests, um, advocacy, right? You have Angela Davis. Um, part of this notion of liberation is the belief that Black people will exist and thrive in the future. So just like you can't have Afrofuturism without Black liberation, you can't have Black liberation if you don't think we're actually going to be liberated, right? It is a, I don't want to even say prophetic, but it is a proleptic um, understanding of, hey, we're better than this. We are, we are humans. We can have this. We can thrive. This is a thing that we can have. So I'm going to push against all of this thing that says that I can't because I know that we can. And I know that even the things I do today, if I don't see it in my lifetime, that there's a possibility that I create for the people that come after me. So in so many ways, a lot of the people in the Underground Railroad, a lot of the people that lived and breathed and engaged their lives during the time um, of enslavement were creating possibilities for the people that came after them. And so in many ways, you can say that that is a kind of seed into this artifact and this culture of Afrofuturism. Um, I want to share a clip from... <laughs> I'm never going to point the right way. Just assume I'm pointing. I'm just going to do this. Over. I'm going to um, show a clip from Black Panther because I think that there is such richness in the understanding of liberation when it comes to Black Panther. And this scene in particularly um, says a lot about um, how our understandings of liberation is not a monolith. Um, and I want to be able to show that. So we're going to do something unique for the thing. I need to move you out the way so I can stop sharing. And Eden, are you going to lead the way? Okay. And so here's the clip of Black Panther. It should be coming up in about a second. Can you all see that? Good. And I'll play it. And I'm going to try it again and make sure I have all the sound turned on. That will help. Here we go. Teta, speak. I'm standing in your house, serving justice to a man who stole your vibranium and murdered your people. Justice your king couldn't deliver. I don't care that you brought Claw. Only reason I don't kill you where you stand is because I know who you are. Now what do you want? I want the throne. <laughs> hey, you, the tuna. <laughs> Y'all sitting up here comfortable. Must feel good. It's about two billion people all over the world that looks like us, but their lives are a lot harder. Wakanda has the tools to liberate them all. And what tools are those? Vibranium. Your weapons. Our weapons will not be used to wage war on the world. It is not our way to be judge, jury, and executioner for people who are not our own. Not your own. But didn't life start right here on this continent? So ain't all people your people? I am not king of all people. I am king of Wakanda. And it is my responsibility to make sure our people are safe and that vibranium does not fall into the hands of a person like you. Son, 
We have entertained the charlatan for too long. Reject his request. Oh, I ain't requesting nothing. Ask who I am. You're Eric Stevens. An American black operative. A mercenary nicknamed Killmonger. That's who you are. That's not my name, princess. Ask me, King. No. Ask me. Take him away. Ungubani! Indingu and Jadaka! Unyanaka and Jogu! Huh? Unyanaka and Jogu? I found my daddy with panther claws in his chest! You ain't the son of a king, you are a son of a murderer! We have a sisa! Lies! I'm afraid not, Queen Mother. Huh? You? Indanda took and Jogu. Hey, Auntie. I'm exercising my blood right. The challenge for the mantles of King and Black Panther. Do not do this, T'Challa. As the son of Prince Inyobu, he is within his rights. He has no rights here. The challenge will take weeks to prepare. Weeks? I don't need weeks. The whole country ain't gotta be there. I just need him and somebody to get me out of these chains. T'Challa, what do you know of this? I accept your challenge. Ooh, I'm kidding. Okay, so let me go back to sharing while I'm... And that died. Okay, great. Let me go back here, see if it stayed the same. I don't know, is it going to... Please don't do it all over again. It's the worst. Okay, so what you have that's so interesting about this piece is not just, you know, all the different family dynamics, of course, and also my favorite line, the hey auntie line, which is one of the best lines in the um, in the series. But what you have here is this notion, this idea of the character Killmonger, who I consider to be a complicated vil villain, coming in with this idea of, hey, I am going to help to liberate the people. And he says, I, there are a whole bunch of people who look like us who don't live there. And he says, how do you want us to liberate them? And he says two things that I think are important. He says, the vibranium. And then he says, your weapons. And I think this is really interesting because as we know from this piece, vibranium can do a lot. It doesn't just make weapons. They've sewn it into their clothes. It is a part of their healing technology. There's all of these different things that vibranium can technically offer the world. But for Killmonger, the way to liberation is through war, right? And that has a lot to do with his, his notion of, of his, um, his idea of liberation, his growing up, his training, all of that. But there are a lot of people who go around and go, you know, Killmonger wasn't wrong about what he wanted, right? Um, and then there's the idea of T'Challa, Chang Bozen, rest in peace, who has this, this notion of, one, I take care of my people first, but then even after this whole saga is over, his understanding of we do need to open up to the world. We do need to create spaces for people to find liberation. He does end up going back to where um, Killmonger was raised and buying those buildings and saying, we're going to build this exploration and these resources so that we can begin to help our people come out of its place. And so it's this notion of, the complexities of how we address liberation. And I think that, that they did it really well in showing like all of the different um, struggles that both T'Challa's character and Killmonger's character were having in how to respond to the power they had as related to the liberation of their people. So that's just an example, flip picture. Um, secondly is technology. Technology is probably one of the most um, obvious things when people think about Afrofuturism outside of, you know, science fiction. Um, we were thinking about, as you see at the very top there, Wakanda, um, the beautiful kind of landscaping, the way in which they incorporated the history of the African history into the futuristic thing, which we'll talk about when we get to time. You have um, artists like Janelle Monet, who um, created a character, Cindy Merriweather, who is a cyborg and does certain acts of liberation in her in her visual album, Dirty Computer, um, and how she carries that throughout her music. You have um, Cyborg, who's science, um, 
comics. And then you have um, Alondra Nelson, who's up here in the corner in the chair. Um, Mark Dreary coined the term Afrofuturism in 1993, but Nelson was one of the main people to help gather the community. And she did this through the internet, through chat rooms, using the technology to really gather the community to push forward the idea of Afrofuturism in the late 90s. So she is heralded as one of the first um, curators and, and people to really steward the community of Afrofuturists and artists who were blurreds, right? Black nerds in the space. And then right to my left, you have um, the understanding of inventors. And that's what we're going to talk about because it's not just about the art that we're creating in technology, it's about the actual technology that we create. So um, person over here, oh, crap. Yeah, why is it mirrored? It's so weird. Okay. Um, in this corner here, this gentleman here is Philip. I don't want to butcher his last name, but I'll type it in the chat later on. He's a Nigerian-born math genius who helped to create the formula that allowed computers to communicate at once, which was the predecessor to the internet actually being created. So he's one of the key components of um, creating internet. You have, um, oh, I'm going to forget all of these names, so please forgive me. I'm going to do that later. I'm not raising my hand. Um, you have the uh, African American who invented the automatic doors on the S on the elevator didn't invent the elevator, but invented that concept of having automatic doors open and shut. Um, you have the invention of the ironing board. You have what's over here in this corner, um, the gentleman who invented the super soaker, and then right above me, I have just the refrigerator. But um, the actual notion of traveled refrigeration. So when you see the large trucks that are traveling with cold food. Um, the invention of refrigeration was actually created by African-American who also created an additional 40 patents in the area of refrigeration. Um, and you have other, other famous ones, right? You know, that people that have created the traffic light and all these different things that we hear about every Black, every, you know, Black History Month. But I think that the notion of innovation and creativity in the realm of invention and science is also just as important to the understanding of Afrofuturism um, as it is the artistic concepts of it. Time. So time is probably, checking my time, um, one of the biggest notions when we think about Afrofuturism because we only think about Afrofuturism as the future. Afrofuturism is about what happens in the future. It's only about the future. It is not. The future is a huge part of it, but Afrofuturism never allows you to forget the past. It allows you to remember the past. It, in many ways, goes to reclaim the past. And it gives you a posture for how you presently act, right? So the notion of how you relate to the future shifts those two ideas. So if I'm a person that says, I believe that all of who I am will exist and thrive in the future, that is going to change how I exist right now. That is going to change my posture and how I act right now. If I am in a community that says, yes, we affirm your thriving in the future and now, that means that there are current present things that have to change in order for that reality to be a possibility and for that reality to be a reality, right? Oftentimes we see a lot of lip service of the kinds of liberation that we want, but there is no current present change. And so you say, well, if you want this future to exist, this is what we have to do right now in order for that future to be. Um, uh, mostly it's her last name, but the image in the in the in the big in the middle, um, there are black people in the future was an artistic kind of billboard thing where um, this artist put these billboards up all throughout the country and and it created such a conversation point because some people were like, again, the shift of the absurdity, right? Upset that these billboards were up, but then it's like, what are you actually upset about? What are you actually upset about, right? Um, created a lot of waves and just kind of reminded people that like, we do this because we do have a future and we are in the future. And so we're going to write ourselves and create ourselves and create the worlds in that. Um, Jason Wise is an independent um, comic idea that's based on this character who is an immortal scholar and he fights against um, all different notions of darkness and injustice. And it's just another way in which the someone of someone that is incorporating the past into notions of Afrofuturism. So reclaiming that sense of past. Um, 
I want to say it's not on here, but there is a, that's also incorporated in time. There is a restaurant in the DC area called Bronze. If you're ever in the DC area, I highly recommend it. It's an Afrofuturist restaurant. And the premise is um, the chef created a character whose last name is Bronze, that is a spice trader from Africa that is trading spices in the past in a world where colonialism never existed. And so the restaurant then asked the question, what would the food taste like now if that was if that was that world? Right. So you have all of these different infusions with Japanese and all these different world cultures infused into African diasporic recipes and spices because it's this thing of what would have been shared if colonialism never happened. So this he's taken this past possibility and has created a concept around it for us to be able to understand, wow, what are the possibilities that we missed out on because of our histories? And how can we reclaim them? We'll come back to that theme. So you see, I'm saying all of the different themes at once because it's not it's not in step, but they're all working together. Um, this one, I'm stuck. I'm gonna stop pointing. I'm just gonna stop pointing. Pointing is not good. Um, Kindred. Kindred is one of the most famous novels as uh, in addition to Parable of the Sword by Octavia Butler. It was just turned into a TV show. But the whole concept of Kindred is about a young black woman who um, goes, who is involuntarily taken back into the antebellum South and she discovers that the person that she is called to save is her white male ancestor. And she, in, in a sense, has to ensure that her great, 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 however many great grandfather rapes her great, 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 however many grandmother in order to ensure that she will be born. Um, Butler wrote this, um, part of the, one of the reasons that Butler wrote this is she was in a class at Pasadena City College, which is down the street here. Um, and there was a student who was going on and on about how he would have done things differently if he was back in there and, and this time period. And why didn't they fight harder? And why didn't they do these things? And it upset Butler. And she said, you don't know what the people in the past had to deal with. And you, and you are a result of all of the things that they had to endure. So you can't say it is, it is disrespectful for you to say, I would have just done this and that. Because the only reason you can say that is because of the sacrifices that they made. And so this is the idea of how would you like it if you and your idea and your thinking right now had to survive in that world. And so that kind of was one of the sparks that sparked this piece. Um, there's a lot of controversy about, there's a lot of controversy about um, whether or not this is a good adaptation of the book. I will leave that to you, but we're going to, I'm going to stop sharing again. And we are going to... Um, watch a trailer. Sounds like you were just sleepwalking. This has never happened before. Mm. Can be caused by sleep deprivation, stress. <laughs> you know? What is this? Am I dreaming? Is this a dream? The date, the year. Tell me the year. It's 1815. We just heard a lot of screaming. Is everything okay in there? How long was I gone? Less than a minute, not even seconds. It felt like I was gone for an hour. I know how this sounds. Am I crazy? Surprise. You're not crazy. Whatever this is, it's real.
Excellent. Okay, let me, I think I have figured out how to not hit it, start from the beginning. Let me go ahead and share my slides again. Oh, okay, we have a few more minutes. Okay. Let's see if that worked. I'm sure it's coming up. You're doing great, Tamisha. Oh, great. Yay, it worked. I figured it out. Yay for me. So um, kindred in, in the understanding of time really does press upon us this kind of rootedness in the notion that Afrofuturism doesn't allow you to forget the past. And it actually, you have to contend with the past as a point through the understanding of getting to that future. It also, um, again, with the shifting of the absurd, situates us within a certain aspect of when we say something or when we move into spaces that are that are rooted in Afrofuturism, when Beyonce makes a country album, when so-and-so does this thing and it's pushed back against, it reminds us of the ways in which people who are pushing back against those things in African-American culture have not contended with their own past. So it's never the future of Afrofuturism is never outside of the notion of the past. You see it not just philosophically in notions of kindred or in, in notions of like the shifting of the absurd, but you also see it um, aesthetically in the aspect of thinking about um, Black Panther and the work of Ruth Carter and the work of the set designers and the ways in which they did not create some kind of futuristic um, Africa that did not incorporate the histories, but it was deeply rooted in the histories and the traditions of um, various different African cultures, from the language to the clothing to all of these different nods to the histories and notions of, Af of various African culture, even as they are imagining it in a futuristic world, right, where colonialism never touched them. So you cannot talk about the future without talking about the past. And you can't talk about e either of them without having direct implications to your current present life. I think we're going to, for the sake of time, I want to go through this pretty quickly. We're not going to go to the screen video, so I won't um, shut it off. But I just want to quickly talk about space. Space is the place, as says Sun Ra, who is right here. Um, he, Sun Ra, he's a super interesting character. This is back in the, I want to say the 40s. He's a jazz kind of character who has um, a experience with extraterrestrials. And that shapes his whole notion of the music that he offers. And he, he, he seeks on a quest to offer music as healing. And he creates a band called the Orchestra. And he infuses a lot of the different things of space as the place in which we dwell to find our liberation, incorporated into different ancient African themes. And is heralded as one of the forefathers of Afrofuturism. Um, obviously, you have uh, the notion of Star Trek. You have the mothership. Uh, you have, uh, I can't remember who painted this painting. I can find out. Um, but the notion of space and of dwelling is and dwelling in space, of Black people being in space, of the notion and the concept of space um, is also very central to Afrofuturism. The, the video that we're not going to watch is actually uh, Michael, Jack, Michael and Janet Jackson's video, Scream, where they are talking about both their frustrations with their the way in which celebrities impacted on them and also their frustrations with the injustices in the world. But I think it's an interesting commentary that two black artists who have as much power as they do when, when at least one of them is alive, feel that the only way they can truly express themselves is to go to outer space. Like there's literally nowhere in the world where they can freely share what it is that they share about their injustices and what it is to be black people in America. Like that's actually saying something. Um, up in the upper left-hand corner, you have... Octavia E. Butler Landing, which uh, is so great, so dear to my heart, because uh, part of the Earthseed belief is that the destiny of Earthseed is to take root among the stars. So she did believe in space travel. She followed um, the space race very closely, and it was something very dear to her, and it influenced so much of her work. So space is extremely important. Please ask me questions about that. I am whizzing through this because we're running out of time. Fast, final thing is the reclamation of Inel of culture and alternative futures. So you have this primarily in, if anybody's seen Lovecraft Country, Lovecraft Country is based off of the work of science fiction writer um, H.P. Lovecraft, 
who was a very prolific science fiction writer and also very racist. And um, another author decided to create a world that was based in his work, but addressed some of the racism. And this TV show was actually based off of that book and it got a lot of critical acclaim. Um, and it also addressed a lot of different aspects in African-American culture, including the notion of sundown towns and the relationship between African and indigenous people and all of these different notions of African-American culture and life that is embedded into a kind of scary monsters um, and all of the different things. So it's about um, the shaping of writing African-Americans into the science fiction genre, but you'll have a story about Octavia Butler and that during the break or during the questions, if you want to know. Um, these other two pieces, uh, the one in the middle is Kehinde Wiley and the one in the end, which we're going to talk about in greater detail, is Harmonia Rosales. And this is kind of like the reclamation of a culture or um, the reclamation of the aspect of a culture. So there's a lot of controversy with this piece. Um, I don't know if anybody is familiar with this particular piece. Um, but as you know, it's obviously identical to God and Adam. Um, Harmonia Rosales is an Afro-Latina um, visual artist who originated in Miami. I think she's back in Los Angeles now. But she painted this piece replacing, obviously, Adam and God with Black women. And it caused a lot of controversy. How dare you make God a Black woman? What are you really saying, person? Right? Shifting the absurd. And so a lot of her pieces, as well as a lot of Kehinde's, Kehinde Wiley's pieces, he's most noted for doing the Obama painting, but he does a lot of work in thinking about how to take classical portraiture and to put Black and brown people in the notion of classical portraiture. It, it, it addresses the sense of why haven't Black people been included in this style of portraiture um, because of the societal, social, economic notion of who gets to participate in this kind of uh, um, portraiture and this kind of style of painting. Um, these two artists are seeking to reclaim their sense of culture by bringing in black and brown bodies into that space. Um, there is some kind of pushback though, because some people say, well, why do we have to still fit within the confounds of European notions of beauty or European um, art? What does it look like to have something outside of that? And I think that there's space and room for both of those notions, but I think that there is a space for the, rec the reclamation of culture and space and body and life um, that is a part of the Afrofuturist um, world as well. Um, where are we now? Okay, we're at break. I'm gonna stop sharing. We have, I've talked really long. We have a few minutes for questions. Yes, I see Tom, I see Monica. Go ahead, Tom. Thank you, Monica. Um, so, Doctor, uh, I was uh, really interested in the movie version of The Shack. Mm -hmm. Did you see the movie version of The Shack? I haven't seen the movie version of The Shack, but I am aware that Octavia Spencer plays the part of God. Is that correct? Yes. And, uh, and uh, the Holy Spirit is an Asian woman, mm -hmm. and uh, the Jesus figure is a, a person who, who at least, I, I don't know, but at least he isn't like in, in Jesus of Nazareth, where Jesus is, is blue-eyed and blonde-haired, mm -hmm. you know? You know? Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, I was, I mean, I was encouraged that, I mean, maybe it's po beginning to be possible where ladies can figure in our consciousness. And then it was especially encouraging that an African-American lady could figure in our consciousness as God. Mm. And I, I think this says a lot theologically. I know you haven't gone there yet, but anyway, there you go. I'll yeah, no, I think that that's great. A couple of resources, I'm gonna shoot them out to you. So I'll, sorry, sorry, Edna, this is, I told you it's gonna happen. I have to be warned. Um, so uh, the first piece is, uh, I haven't read it, but uh, the work of Christina Cleveland, um, she recently wrote a book called God is a Black Woman, and she deals with the theological implications of race and divinity and all of those things that I think uh, I recommend that to you. The other piece, though, that I have read and I have taught is a short story by Octavia Butler called um, The Book of Martha. Um, Book of Martha is based on a young writer named Martha, and God appears to her and says, if he can change one thing about humankind, what would it be? 
I and the, and whatever you decide, that's what I'll do. And it sparks this really interesting conversation and this conundrum for what she will decide to do. But what's also interesting about this is that God, who God is, changes throughout the story. So what God looks like shifts throughout the story. And it's a really interesting shift. Um, and, it's, and they have a conversation about it. So I highly commend, like if you're thinking about the ways in which the divinity is depicted, I highly recommend um, that work to you because I think that there is a long history about um, the notions of whiteness and divinity and the ways in which white Jesus and white God has been portrayed in that sense. And what is the reclamation of uh, something like James Cone saying that God is black, right? God is on the inside of the oppressed, right? How we see God shifts, how God shows up. Um, and also that contending with the, you know, historical categories that we are trying to wrestle with when it comes to terms of Jesus or the divinity. Um, this is also a really important conversation when it comes to gender as well. Monica? Yeah, thanks, Dr. Tyler. I, this is a fairly new topic for me, and so um, I have some questions bubbling up that have they don't have a lot a lot of knowledge behind them. So um, I'm really curious about how much um, Afrofuturism leans into either um, the supernatural or a completely fabricated space to have these really positive visions of like an African future um, in comparison with, are there uh, writings or creative things that like, um, you, you talked about that a lot of things are based in acknowledging the past, but are there things that take like what is broken right now and like project that out into something, um, a really positive future? Um, yeah, that doesn't have to be divorced from kind of to make this whole sci-fi world. I'm just curious about that. Yeah. Um... I was going to say a thing and I was like, that's a dystopian novel. Um, I would probably, <laughs> I will say, if you haven't read Parable of the Sower though, and we're going to hear, um, I'll let Buller explain it to you in the next, like, there is an interview part where she explains what she's doing with the notion of religion and how she understands religion. Um, I'm going to think about that takes it and, and goes it straight positive. I don't think there's, there's, there's no, utopias in Afrofuturism mm -hmm. that I that I can find. I think the closest utopia you probably get is Black Panther. Mm -hmm. um, and that is still rife with all kinds of conflict and things. And I think it's partly it's because because we hold on to the notion of the past. Um we don't um we're not ignorant to this understanding of like what has come after us and what it has cost for us to get to where we are. Um, and then secondly, utopias are real. <laughs> dystopias mm -hmm. are way more real than utopias, right? For every, you know, for anybody who's a Hunger Games fan, for every District 1, there's a District 12, <laughs> right? For every yeah. utopia, there's a dystopia, right? And even the dystopias that try to erase the notions of like race or like different, right? You do that, you get novels like The Giver, where mm. they have to erase the memory of people in order for that to work. And that doesn't work. So yes. I think the realism in having to contend with the past and try to push for a positive future and like still contending with that, I feel feels more real than any utopia I think a person can make. Sure. And I guess I wasn't going so so much into utopia as just more this curiosity about the motivation for all the um, science fiction or the kind of... Uh, yeah, the magical realism that happens. And um, yeah, whether that's just a draw to um, kind of escapism that uh, we all need or like what what the underpinnings of some of that is too, that that's so prevalent in Afrofuturism. So. The underpinnings of, of why people engage with like supernatural or spiritual kind of notion. Yeah, like, or just yeah. completely <laughs> removed from our time and yeah, timeline and space time continuum. Yeah, I think that that's a really good question. I think part of it is historically like African diasporic and African American culture is so it's is rooted in such a deep kind of spiritual supernatural kind of space that these are things that are often um very central to African and African American culture that has often been ostracized or de you know demonized, right? And so so um a really great book for that. Sorry, Eden. Um Race and Secularity in America. It is an edited volume by Vincent Lloyd and Andrew Prevo. And the 
introduction chapter is really interesting because they talk about the notions of um, how things that we have determined secular or secularity is based on this sense of racial lines. And so a lot of the spiritualities that have been demonized or a lot of the ways in which um, African-American people and other indigenous people have treated certain practices as something that was deeply spiritual were utilized into being secular as a, as a kind of like shift in the notion of like white supremacy and things. And so the ties between the notion of whiteness and white supremacy and the notion of what is and isn't acceptable as spirituality, I think is part of that. Um, so I think part of it is there's always been this rootedness into the spirituality and culture of African-Americans. Um, I think the other part is um, not so much escapism, but maybe a commentary on the fact that the atrocities and the rootedness of a certain, certain types of supremacy um, of these isms that we feel are so completely ingrained in our culture that the only way we are able to escape them is to create a whole and totally different world. And I think that um, that is a commentary in and of itself. I think you have a little bit of both of, um, Butler is a terrible example of this because even when she creates other worlds, it's like people bring their stuff with them. <laughs> Don't read Butler if you're trying to read any utopia. Uh, but uh, realistically, um, there is a sense of like the screen video. We have to go to a whole nother planet just to kind of be ourselves without having to deal with people judging us based on, you know, our skin color, our gender, you know, presentation, who we decide to love, um, what kind of abilities we have, right, or disabilities, right? So like, we have to create a whole nother world to, so we won't be pigeonholed into these things. I think that that can often be more commentary on the hierarchies in the world that we've created as opposed to just simply an escapism. But that's just my initial thoughts. I'll, I'll think about that more, it's a great question. Um, we got time for one, two more questions before we break. Yes, Eleanor. So kind of along that same line, uh, no, no doubt that a lot of inventions from black people, but it seems to me that the major innovations in technology right now in terms of AI, for instance, are by white men <laughs> and they're replicating the world in which we are living. Your thoughts mm -hmm. on that? That is an excellent question. See, I wish we had more time because I would love to hear everybody's thoughts on this. But I think that there is, what I will say is um, <laughs> a couple of things. There's a lot of really good, I can't remember what the TikTok person is, but there are a lot of really good TikToks that talk about the bias in AI um, that actually do live videos of typing something in AI, like show me a person that's this and they, the AI will generate the same race or the same gender or the same, there's no diversity because what AI is pulling from is the things that we have rendered important on the internet, right? So it, it cannot escape the hierarchies and the silos that we have already created. It is pulling from us, right? Technology is first and foremost an extension of who we are, right? So a rake, which is technology, is an extension of our arm to help us gather more leads, right? AI is just an extension of whoever the creator is, right? And what we have deemed to be important. So I think this is a really, this is a really important conversation that's happening in some of the places of, of artificial intelligence. It's the bias that we can recreate. I think it also helps us to address some of the fears of AI, right? People have this fear that AI is gonna take us over and technology is gonna take us and ruin our lives. I was like, um, do you have a cell phone? You have a computer? It already does. The thing that you are fearing has already happened. So would, no, okay. go ahead. So would it make a difference if, if the tech world was more diverse? Absolutely, because I think it's not just, I think part of part of the, the and I want to say culturally diverse, not only racially diverse. And the reason that I say that is because a lot of times when people try to create a certain notion of racial diversity, they'll they'll acquire they require a certain level of assimilation into a particular cultural mindset, and you will get different people who look different who think the same. Um, I think true cultural diversity is going to bring different kinds of practices and and understandings of how you relate to people, how you relate to the land, how what is important, right? And so those different cultural understandings will bring in um, different approaches and ways of thinking about something like artificial intelligence. Um, this happens even in the medical field. There's this it's 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 a funny story, but also it's a real story about um, 
a black nurse, she's sharing about one of her colleagues came in and wanted to do a 5150 on a patient. And she's like, why, what's going on? And she's like, the patient is hitting herself over and over. And I don't understand what is happening. The patient is like, maybe there's some, some mental things happening and da, da, da. And so the black nurse goes, is she doing this? And the white nurse goes, yes. And she goes, oh no, she must have either a weave or hair and she can't scratch her hair. So that's how she scratches her scalp. Cultural perspective, right? It's a funny story, but it also goes to show how certain things that are that are culturally known and other things can be interpreted completely wildly. And so I think, yes, you need diverse cultural voices and all fields, but particularly in the notion of AI, because it really does address what we've deemed to be important um, in the realm of information. And I think that that's what the AI is pulling from. I will stay on. Let's go ahead and take, I don't know how long of a break eating we want to take, but I'm still going to be here. Um, <laughs> not like going anywhere. So um, let's take a break. And then when we come back, we'll get into some of the theological themes. That part will be shorter. So we'll have more time to talk. <laughs> Folks, how about a five minute break? I'll put a five minute timer up. That'll give us time to stretch, do what you need to do. Come back. Sound good? Okay. Thanks, Anton. You bet. Here's a timer. And we are back. All right, let me go ahead and I'm going to get this, share my screen again. Oh, I forgot to hide the, ah, that's fine. I was doing so well with hiding all the slides. We have the 6.30? Okay. I'm not going to breeze through this, but I'm going to talk kind of fast. So think about your questions and then we're, so we can have more time to discuss and not you look at me on the screen. So we talked about the themes. We talked about technology and space and re reclamation of cultures and Black liberation and time. Um, let's talk about some of the theological themes within Afrofuturism. Um, themes like the prophetic imagination, themes like the shaping God, complicated hope, speculation and eschatology, um, and also the differentiation. We talked about a little bit in the last section about um, the Black church and Black religion. We talked about secularity and spirituality. Um, so first and foremost, um, prophetic imagination. So, <clears throat> oh, I can move me. Why am I doing? Yep. You know, I have a PhD. I promise that I do. Uh, so, Two works that I do want to share. The first work is, is talking about the sense of the dreamer and the dream. Dreamer and the dream is a work by Roger Sneed. It it's, talks about Black religion and futurist thought. It is based on the Deep Space Nine episode, Fall of Our Stars, Something of Our Stars. It's when um, uh, Captain Seiko is pulled. He has a dream and he's pulled back in time where he's a science fiction writer. Um, in the, I don't know, 20s or so. And he's dealing with um, not being able to write a short story that features a black man and the ways in which he has to fight for uh, his own presence in his own writing, which people are reading. And about, um, there's one part in the episode where the reverend in the episode, who's actually his father in the, in the real life, is saying how, you know, you're the dreamer and the dream. And so he, he begins to write about his actual life on the Enterprise in Deep, in Deep Space Nine as a captain. And they're like, this is a great story. We love it. But it can't be led by a Black man. He goes, well, why not, right? So he's he's talking about the notion of being both the dreamer, the one who's dreaming about this thing, and the dream. Like, he occupies both spaces. And so it's just this notion uh, of the way of um, his call by the reverend into this, like, prophetic space is kind of like this liminal duality, double consciousness that he's having to deal with. So he talks, um, to me, talks a lot about that and a lot about the different aspects of religion and different notions of science fiction and Afrofuturism. Highly recommend the work. Um, I want to talk about the notion of, when we talk about prophetic imagination, about the difference in prophecy, when we talk about foretelling, we talk about foretelling. 
And I'm getting a little passionate because I love this conversation. So most of the time when we talk about prophecy, especially in aspects of science fiction, we're talking about like, oh, this is a prophecy that whoever holds this ring years from now, right? We think about the fairy tale stories of 20 years from now, someone will come and they will, right? This is also how we interpret the Bible oftentimes. Well, someone will come from you. This is this is all of the, the concepts and the things about, obviously, about the Messiah. But like, that's all we think prophecy is. It's this notion of tell me the future. Tell me what is to come for me. Um, but if you really look at the role of the prophets, a lot of the work that they're doing is forth telling. They are reading the writing on the wall. They are speaking truth to power. They are saying, God told you not to do this. If you keep doing this, this is what will happen. And then the people kept doing it. And then it happened. Then they go, you're a prophet. And they're just like, I kind of feel there's a lot of face palming in the prophets because I think that this is probably part of it, right? You have this back and forth between the prophets telling the people, this is what God has said. This is this is what you need to do in order to change your ways and the people either do or they don't. But it's really a lot about this sense of speaking truth to power. And I think a lot of what we think about in futurism, particularly and in Octavia Butler specifically, um, deals with this notion of prophecy as foretelling. So as you know, Butler wrote, let me make sure if this is the, it is. Okay, so we'll leave it here because we're going to listen to this interview. But Butler wrote the book Parable of the Sower and... 2020, it was the first time she ever made it on the, the bestsellers list. And it was because of how close she gets to what is happening in her time. Part of it is because um, it started to gain a lot more popularity in the 2016 election, because in the second book of the series, there is a fundamentalist pastor who gets elected president. And in his speech after he's elected, he says, we need to come together to make America great again. And because of the 2016 election and campaign, because of this notion of Trump, People were like, oh my God, prophecy, prophecy. Ah. And it's like, hmm, not foretelling. Trump didn't invent that. That was from Reagan, Nixon, all these different people, this idea of making, making America great again. And what that actually meant was not new before Trump started using it, right? And so what Lorette is going to explain here is picking up on things that are happening and is using it as what she calls here a cautionary tale. So we're going to hear from her own words about how she thinks about this notion of prophecy and also um, her understanding of how she incorporates religion into her work. This is Democracy Now!, the quarantine report. I'm Amy Goodman. To mark Black History Month once again, as well as the 25th anniversary of Democracy Now!, we turn now to one of the last television interviews given by the visionary Black science fiction writer Octavia Butler. In November 2005, she came into Democracy Now!'s old firehouse studio. Just three months later, Butler died on February 24, 2006, after she fell outside Outside her home outside of Seattle, Washington. She was 58 years old. Butler was the first black woman to win the Hugo and Nebula Awards for science fiction writing. She was also the first science fiction writer to receive a MacArthur Genius Fellowship. Butler's best known books include the classics Kindred, as well as Parable of the Sower and Parable of the Talents, two thirds of a trilogy that was never finished. Published in 1990, Parable of the Sower is set in the 2020s in California. That's right, the 2020s now in California, amidst a global climate and economic crisis. Octavia Butler described them as cautionary tales. They were what I call uh, cautionary tales. Um, if we keep misbehaving ourselves, ignoring what we've been ignoring, um, doing what we've been doing to the environment, for instance, um, here's what we're liable to wind up with. In her books, Octavia Butler also wrote about slavery, about fascism, about religious fundamentalism, and so much more. 
Her work inspired a new generation of black science fiction writers. She's been called the mother of Afrofuturism. And Octavia Butler's audience has continued to grow. In September, she made it the New York Times bestseller list for the first time, 50 years after she began writing and nearly 15 years after her death. Democracy Now!'s Juan Gonzalez and I interviewed Octavia Butler in November of 2005. It was shortly after Hurricane Katrina devastated New Orleans. President George W. Bush, the former governor of Texas, was in the White House overseeing the U.S. wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Part of this interview aired live, but some of it has never been broadcast before. How did you first start writing science fiction? Uh, you were... You grew up in uh, in Pasadena. Mm -hmm. uh, in uh, uh, how did you first become attracted to th uh, that type of writing? Oh, I, I think I loved it because um, well, I fell into writing it because I saw a bad movie, um, a movie called uh, Devil Girl from Mars, and went into competition with it. But I think I stayed with it because it was so wide open. It gave me the chance to comment on every aspect of humanity. Um, people tend to think of science fiction as, oh, Star Wars or Star Trek. And the truth is there are no closed doors and there are no required formulas. You can, um, you can go anywhere with it. We're talking to Octavia Butler. Uh, her latest book is Fledgling, wrote the parable series as Katrina was happening, the, the aftermath of Katrina. A lot of people were talking about Octavia Butler and how the parable series made them think about that. Explain. I, I wrote um, um, the, the two parable books back in the, the 90s. And they are books about, as I said, what happens because we don't trouble to um, um, correct some of, some of the problems that we're, we're brewing for ourselves right now. Um, global warming is one of those problems. And I was aware of it back in the 80s. I was reading books about it. And a lot of people were, were seeing it as... Um, as politics, as something very iffy, as something they could ignore because nothing was going to come of it tomorrow. Um, that and the fact that I, I think I was, I was paying a lot of attention to education because a lot of my friends were teachers and the politics of, 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 of education was, was getting uh, scarier, it seemed to me. We, we were getting to that point where we were more were thinking more about um, the building of prisons than of schools and libraries. And um, I remember while I was uh, working on the novels, um, my hometown, Pasadena, had a bond issue uh, that they passed to um, aid libraries. And I was so happy that it passed because uh, so often these things don't. And they had um, um, closed a lot of, of branch libraries and, and were able to reopen them. So um, not everybody was going in the wrong direction. But um, a lot of us, a lot of a lot of the country still was. And what I wanted to write was a novel of someone who was coming up with solutions of a sort. Uh, my character, my main character's solution is, uh, well, grows from another religion that she comes up with. Um, religion is everywhere. There are no human societies without it, um, whether they acknowledge it as religion or not. So I thought um, religion might be an answer as well as, in some cases, a problem. And in, for instance, Parable of the Sower and Parable of the Talents, it's both. So I have people who are um, um, bringing America to a kind of fascism because their religion is the only one they're willing to tolerate. On the other hand, I have people who are saying, well, here is another religion and here are some, some uh, verses that, that can help us think in a different way and here is a destination that um, isn't um, something that we, ha we have to wait for after we die. Octavia Butler, could you read a little from Parable of the Talents? Um, I'm going to read um, a verse or two, um, and keep in mind these were written um, early in the 90s, but um, I think they, they apply forever, actually. Um, this first one, I have a, a character in, in the books um, who is, a, um, well, someone who is taking the country fascist 
and who manages to get elected president, and um, who oddly enough comes from Texas. And here is um, one of the things that my character is um, inspired to write about this sort of situation. She says, choose your leaders with wisdom and forethought. To be led by a coward is to be controlled by all that the coward fears. To be led by a fool is to be led by the opportunists who control the fool. To be led by a thief is to offer up your most precious treasures to be stolen. To be led by a liar is to ask to be lied to. To be led by a tyrant is to sell yourself and those you love into slavery. So yes, forth telling. We're gonna keep going. This is the last time I'm gonna to have to do this, so we'll just be able to plow straight through. So Butler creates this space where um, she's seeing and peeping and thinking about things that are happening in the world. And she writes a story of what happens if we don't change. But she doesn't leave us there. She recognizes that religion, as she said, right? Religion is, is there's another quote where she says, religion is something that humanity has used throughout time to evoke change in the world, whether good or bad. And so she recognizes the power of religion and belief and, and hones in on that as a way to address not only some of the ecological environment to all these different things, but as a way to name the kind of change that could be necessary for us to be able to see a new and better world. This is still though coupled with this sense of, um, I think Monica, you had talked about earlier about this escapism, right? The destiny of Earth seed is to take root amongst the stars. And so a lot of the, the, the space and the way in which Butler creates has not only influenced the science fiction world, but it has also influenced the, uh, I'll make my image larger. Do you not see it the whole screen or is it small? Or? No, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. It's just, you're very small in the corner. I want to see you better. I'm Oh, I'm small. I am small. I was actually yeah. not paying attention to that. Thank you for that. Um, Sorry, thank you. No, no worries. But um, so part of the idea of shaping God and shaping change comes from Butler. So I know, who was it? Was it Anna? Anna? Anna, maybe it was Anna, that talked about Adrian Marie Brown. So Adrian Marie Brown or her notion of um, emergent strategies and all these different things within the concept of Afrofuturism is based on the idea of shaping change. That is directly related to Butler's notion of shaping God. So in the parable series, Earth Sea Tradition is based on this tenet. All that you touch, you change. All that you change, changes you. The only lasting truth is change. God is change. And this is directly the character is directly pushing towards this type of earthy religion as a direct rejection of her father's Baptist preaching. Her father is a Baptist preacher and, and Lauren herself preached in this Baptist congregation. And so it's interesting that even in the way in which she's trying to evoke a different kind of change, she doesn't abandon the divine altogether. She just says, I think that the God that I've grown up with is inadequate to help me navigate the world that I'm in. So then who is God in this space? And I think that it's really important that she doesn't abandon the theological or the, or the supernatural question, but she uses that, the, both the character and, and Butler, to show a different way. And so Ursi becomes that sense in that way. And I think a lot of the embedded spirituality in Afrofuturism, whether it is radical forms of Christianity or whole types of religion altogether, is, is, is doing what Butler was attempting to do in this work, which is to, as we are creating different ways and different worlds, we're not abandoning the notion of the divine. Um, we're not abandoning the notion of, of transcendence, even if for some people who represent a certain atheism is an is a imminent transcendence, right? There is something that happens when we all come together that is beyond us all. So I think that this notion of spirituality um, 
in various forms of spirituality. I think process works really well in here. So if you read any Monica Coleman, Making a Way Out of No Way, she distinctly talks about um, Butler's work and Roger Schneed and his work calls Earthseed uh, possibly a Black process theology. So there's a lot of that notion even um, intertwined, not only in Butler's work primarily, but throughout Afrofuturism. So shaping God, shaping change is a very important uh, aspect. Secondly, is this notion of complicated hope. I love this idea. <laughs> I think it, it taps into the notions of realism, right? Butler creates these pockets of life, even within the aspect of religion. Um, the Black Panther creates this notion of life, right? And they, there's a lot of religion. We can get into that in questions. Um, there's a lot of religion and, and different aspects and hints at religion and gods in Black Panther as well. But uh, this notion of there's this hopefulness for what's to come, but it's complicated, right? Both complicated in what we have to do to maintain and honor that hope and also complicated in um, how we have to navigate those worlds. So for Butler's world, even as they're fighting for something new, they're fighting through all of the atrocities and craziness that are in the world of, of the parable series, right? But it doesn't mean that Lauren and the characters abandon hope. It just means that their hope looks radically different. And so I think something like this, you know, flower of the rose that grew up from concrete to quote um, Tupac, that there is this sense in this notion of a hopefulness that is steeped into these, these complicated realities. And so it, it causes people to do certain things for the aspect of their survival that becomes extremely complicated and it pushes on um, our moral sensibilities, um, the bo moral boundaries that we create and the notions and understanding of who God is in those moments, especially of atrocities. Um, thirdly, speculation is eschatology. So we talk about this a lot in class and I'm gonna whiz through this. Um, speculation of, as eschatology is a theopoetic notion where I think through how we can understand the practice of, as you see on the left, on the right, world building, speculating, thinking about new worlds and new aspects as a process of eschatology, as a process of the end times, as a process of what's going to happen in the end and how we collectively think about that end directly shapes the way in which we think about our present day. So if you are a part of an eschatological story that says we're all going to be raptured and taken from earth, you have very different understanding of environmental issues than a person who believes that this is the world that we're going to inherit at the end of the story. You, you just, do you do? Because if you're going to be raptured, I'm not going to be here. Why do I care what I'm not going to, this is, this ain't my, I'm not going to. But if you're like, this is what we're getting, hopefully, hopefully, you have very different notions about how to take care of the earth and how to care for the world, right? Um, and so your, your telos shapes your ethos. And so what does it mean then that we create practices of speculation, right? Where we get a chance to have this generative thinking that kind of builds on this generosity, right? That transcends the aspects of generations that creates these beginning sparks in these moments of story and life, right? What does it mean that we have the possibility to play and to question Right? A lot of times when we think about end times, we don't, we're not allowed to question the end point of God. Not allowed to question how God has created the end of the world. Right, It just is, and that's where we're going, and there's nothing we could do about it. But in the notion of Afrofuturism, because part of the ocean is shaping God and that God has changed, it opens up a whole new set of questions for us to think about theologically. Truth telling directly goes back to the fourth playing part of um, prophet, uh, prophetic imagination, right? What does it mean for us to tell the truth about what is actually happening and tell the truth about what those implications are? And world building is a practice and play to go. What are the kinds of worlds that we can create together? What do those worlds look like? Um, so that is, oh, one more. Uh, just a note about um, Afrofuturism does not limit the religious expression to only a Christian context, as we've talked about, um, but it makes a distinction between Black church and Black religion. Um, so Black church has been, uh, the Black Christian Church has been deeply influential in the history of Black culture and Black politics and Black life, mostly because a lot of times that was some of the only spaces where people can go and express the fullness of themselves. Um, but it is not a monolith. Blackness is not a monolith. Afrofuturism is not a monolith. So there are other religious expression, including a non-religious or an atheist expression uh, within the notion of Afrofuturism. And so we need to honor those distinctions. Um, 
as Roger Schneed says, our freedom is not bound by conception of a Christian God. And though this may, though this class, the general class, may focus on Christian experiences of God, we must be mindful of the ways that Afrofuturism exists outside of these limits. So part of what we do within the class, I'm going to stop sharing because so we can talk, is we think about the ways in which our own religious traditions intersect with these ideas about Afrofuturism. Where are their resonances? Right? Huh, I relate to that. That reminds me of this tradition we do in our church, or that reminds me of this concept, right? And where is there a little rub? That idea of God being changed rubs me the wrong way because it's rubbing up against this theological pillar within my tradition, right? So how can we understand um, the realities of our own context and to understand that we are a world, we represent a world, but the artifact and the thing that we are we are studying, we're looking at, when we're talking about also represents a world. So what happens when those worlds collide? Um, and we have to think about that theologically because there are things that we may bring, right? That may be central and rooted for us that may not have anything to do with the thing that we're studying. And we need to be careful about trying to either appropriate or assimilate that thing into our world. So it's just a way to make and honor that distinction so that when we're engaging and talking about those things, we can talk about them appropriately. So that's a short kind of snippet. I told you this part would be shorter because I wanna hear from you your questions, your pushback, your uncomfortabilities, um, what stuck out to you, what other theological questions you may have, what other theological things you that came up for you when we were talking about the artifacts. Talk to me. This feels kind of basic, but I'm just going to say it anyway that Afrofuturism, as well as other kinds of predictive fiction, feel very synergistic to me, or like a um, spirited, spirited expression of the already and not yet that our <laughs> faith teaches us that is so mysterious, that is so confounding, that we know we need, and we don't know what it means. And so these um, writings feel like they're a gift to that exploration. Yeah, absolutely. I think that there is there's a definite... Um proleptic, prolepsis, prolepsis is the already not like the seeing of the the glimpse of the thing that you're going to behold, right? A lot of people will, I, I say a lot of people because I don't remember their specific names. A lot of people will um, kind of talk about the notion of miracles in this way, right? We see a miracle of healing or the resurrection of Lara. It's this proleptic glimpse of the thing that we will inherit, right? All of the people will be rose from the dead. All of the people will be restored and healed, right? Um, and so I think like, yes, Afrofuturism can create these proleptic pockets in our imagination to go, what are the kind of worlds that we ultimately want to live in and how do we bring pieces of that world into our own? Absolutely. Not basic. <laughs> Other comments, questions, thoughts? Yes, who, Kendra, yes. You're muted. Kendra, you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> uh, you had mentioned fairly early on about um, about generations um, and didn't say much about it, but I'm very curious about that. I think it connects into time, but also um, I don't know, you had mentioned connection with some indigenous kinds of, I mean, that's where I, when I think of like the seven generations kind of a thing that's sometimes I've heard that within that context. Um, um, but just curious how um, generations, past, future, how the, all that kind of. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, it hits on, on, on so many different points. So when I'm thinking about the generative thinking, um, I'm thinking about Makoto Fujimura's work in, is it Culture Care? Where he's talking about, um, generative thinking, he splits it into different G's, right? He talks about Genesis moments, like those moments that spark something creatively and beautiful for us. Um, he talks about um, sense of generosity, right? How we give of ourselves and of others. And there's a space of generosity that creates this generativity. But he also talks about generational thinking. Mm -hmm. And he talks about the, the ways and the things that we inherit, um, the thoughts that we inherit, um, how we pay homage to to the people who have come before us. 
Um, and I think this is deeply rooted in, in the aspect of Afrofuturism. So when you're thinking about something um, like Black Panther, right, to use a popular term, like that's deeply rooted in paying homage to the traditions and the histories that have come before them. It's also deeply rooted in thinking about the relationship between generations, right? So even in the clip that we saw, you have the relationship between the elders giving counsel and the young people who are who are in these powers of authority, right? You have this notion of even in the film where T'Challa goes to the realm of the, the ancestral realm and he's pushing back against the decision that they made about Killmonger and his father and how we should have made a different decision. We should have done something differently. And it's both the notion of honoring the skills and the things that were given before you, but also not always following through, recognizing that they had limitations even in of themselves and they always didn't make the best decisions. And so even as he's wrestling with that decision, he's not wrestling outside of that intergenerational community, right? Mm -hmm. He's both honoring the notion of the generation before him and he's recognizing the ways in which he has to make his own path. And so I think that that, that practice of honoring ancestors, of honoring what has come before you, is deeply embedded into Afrofuturism. Um, Sun Ra points back to a lot of different African traditions, either in closing, either in um, language, right? So a lot of what African-Americans have done um, as a way to try to reclaim some of what has been lost during the transatlantic slave trade and enslavement is to try to create cultural, uh, historical, and generational connections back to certain notions in the context of Africa, right? We don't necessarily, I mean, technology helps even more now, but a lot of people don't necessarily know exactly what traditions they should be inheriting. Um, and so you have the ways in which people are trying to reclaim that so that they can have some kind of generational lineage. You have that both um, between African-Americans in the context of Africa, but then you also have the rich tradition within the generations, even within the Amer African-American context. Does that answer the question or was there more specific? Yeah, no, it wasn't specific. I just was very interested in, for you to say more about um, that gen general question. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Other comments, thoughts, questions, pushback? Please push back. That's fine. We can definitely... Doctor, um, yeah. um, this is the thing for me, okay? Uh, it, 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 talking about what you were talking about, I'm sorry, I'm tired, okay? No, it's so anyway, about, uh, about the shape of God, okay? So, you know... Um, I've been in several different religious traditions now, and it seems like uh, we find a sense of safety of saying that God is like this. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, of course God is like this. God has to be like this, to the point where it's even scary to use something other than a, a, a male pronoun. And I mean, I guess I'm just wondering... Um, what, what, what you think about that? Yeah, so we talk about this a lot when we talk about the notion of God being change <laughs> and shaping God. Um, I think we already do that. <laughs> and here's the thing again, right? We already shape God. We don't know the totality of who God is. Like, we can't know that. We have basically taken a history of people who have had encounters with the divine, that have shaped the way in which they live their lives. That is, the, in the way that they live their lives have in turn shaped the way they interpret those experiences. And they have passed down those stories and those notions and those practices to us for thousands of years. So it's kind of hard to say that we don't shape God in that context. I think what is really difficult for people is the notion that my life, my practices, who I am, how I relate to the world has been predicated on this certain idea of who God is. And for you to tell me that we can shape God or that God has changed puts all of that into like, it's now on murky, I don't know. It's, it's, it's not stable, right? And so the idea of God not changing is less about um, the possibility of God being different than we thought and in many ways more about our own staking of identity in a particular expression of God. 
and how if one card falls from the card deck, then who are we? As I've experienced it both personally, but also in both teaching and coaching other Christian leaders. But continue, what were you going to say? Well, I mean, the, I mean, um, I hope this is I hope this isn't blasphemous, you know. There's the tradition of the covenants in in the Bible itself, the tradition of covenants, which which underlines the point that you know this is the fixed reality, and that's the way it is, and. Uh, uh, in what way does a person have what it may be even permission what permission do we have to imagine God differently mm, this is good conversation I mean, even, oh. I mean even I mean even in art it's well known right that even in art usually uh, uh, cultural representations of the Lord Jesus are in that culture if, if, if the artist is white oftentimes Jesus is portrayed as white as an example, right? So I don't know. Mm. I, I, I'm raising more questions than I am anyway. No, that's great. This is great. This is exactly where you need to be. Cynthia, help us out. <laughs> Tell us all the answers. I, I, um, I love the story of the burning bush for this very reason, because mm. the idea is that God appears um, and says, I am who I am. I will be who I will be at expressing now and future and also expressing that um, you, you will take what you will and you will make it something different, but I continue to be, I am who I am. And what I find rather funny too, is that they took that and then they used the word Yahweh, which means he is. <laughs> so that, my feeling is that's when God became male if, if that's that that moment when they said God said I am who I am didn't say I'm a man but that's what they took away from it so um, very powerful idea about God. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. This is getting good. Other thoughts. I wanted to ask you because yeah. because he he was talking about heresy. Um, you ended your talk saying be very cautious about appropriation. Um, and I'm just very, I didn't quite, I didn't understand exactly what you, um, are you suggesting that people take this in a direction that doesn't do it justice or that tries to um, make it into something that it's not or I see what you're the caution for you? Well, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, get it. I, I, I see what you're saying. I think I'm going to use the story. So I was on a podcast for a friend and he, we were talking about Black Panther. And he says, this is coming back to the Black Panther religion part. Tell me about the religion in Black Panther. And I said, well, there's, you know, Bast, right? You know, you know, praise be to Bast. And, you know, uh, the Mbaku, he says this, and he goes, glory to Anoman. So they have all these different kinds of gods. And I'm talking about these different things. And I say, I want you to notice, because it's a it's a Christian podcast. I want you to notice, I haven't mentioned Christianity. And he goes, yeah, I said, because based on the world of Black Panther, no one is Christian. And a lot of times when we say, talk about the religion in Black Panther, we start to use it immediately, metaphorically, Mm -hmm. Oh, there's something about the way liberation is happening and T'Challa gets back up and he, right? And we use it in our sermons and we do all these different things. And it's like, great, know that you're using it metaphorically. But the problem is we start to conflate that, you know, now, you know, T'Challa is this messianic figure who comes to say, and it's like, no, <laughs> the, the story is a part of a world. That world isn't Christian. There is a way in which we utilize and engage with these things metaphorically that help us to understand our own perspective of our own world and Christianity, but that doesn't make that thing Christian. And so what I teach my students is there's a difference between your world and the way you interpret the artifact and the world that the artifact itself represents. And I think a lot of times we in our own excitement, <laughs> in our own wanting to connect, we forget that, that 
that there there is a distinction there. And so what I mean, like don't assimilate, I mean, just that, like be careful to maintain the world in which the artifact or the thing is in. It's okay that you find resonances there. It's okay, even if you're using it metaphorically, but oftentimes we then begin to absorb those things into our world, whether that's religious, whether that's cultural, whether that's whatever that is. And we forget that it has its own rootedness, that it has its own thing that it belongs to. It has its own influences and traces and all of these things. So that's that's what I meant when I, when I said that part. So in essence, you're talking about the idea that um, when people, for instance, won't say they're religious or they're Christian, they'll say they're spiritual. And there's a sense in which we get wishy-washy about what it is that we're holding, what what is holding it together. And we begin to collect things from different belief systems that probably weren't meant to necessarily be together or they just need to be named and given an appropriate yeah, hmm. still that's pretty. an interesting take. I, I I don't know about it because a person that says they're not religious, they're spiritual, probably does understand and adapt certain practices from different religions into their practice of spirituality. Um, but that gets a little complicated because so many of the practices that different religions do didn't necessarily begin in those religions. Exactly, and were probably deemed spiritual before they were actually appropriated by religion in the first place so it gets it gets really muggy it's kind of like uh christianity is trying to fight for christmas <laughs> when there's this whole history of the mugginess of like how we even came to have christmas in like the first place the pagan holiday yeah right that has all of these different influence between you know the pagan traditions but then also the understanding of well, what did i learn in that class of like how um uh, certain notions of like when a, if a person died on the day that they were born, but then, or if they believe they died on the day that they were conceived and that's how they got the date for, it's a whole liturgical thing oh, that yeah. I can do in my master's that class, but sense. it's muggy. Yeah. And so when we fight for things that we claim is just wholly ours, we forget that that thing has a, has a world and history and roots that may be different from our own. Mm -hmm. This is great. Other questions, other comments. We got time. We got five minutes. Well, I do push back toward the yeah. idea of, of uh, creating God in art in in some image because I see I see that's so much a problem in our world with Christian nationalism. You know, mm -hmm. if it's good for the nation, it must be. If it's good for me, it must be. It must be from God, it, or good for our nation, it must be from God. So I yes. I really. Uh, I, I really do have a hard time with that idea. Although I know what you're saying is true, that we do shape God. Yes. And it's it's a it's a yes and, right? We shape God in our own sense of interpretation and knowingness, right? And there are so many ways in which we can't know God, but there are so many ways that we can. Mm -hmm. There's so many experiences and traditions and things that we believe that are true, that actually happen, that name an aspect of who God is and how God shows up in the world, that part of your belief in your faith is saying that this thing is definitive, right? It may mean many things, but it can't mean anything, right? So there are, so there is the understanding of this concept of shaping God based on our own perspectives and our experiences is, and what I teach my students, there, you're not completely wholly out of it. It is not this completely otherwise thing that you have just inherited that doesn't have any kind of markings of your culture, your reality, how you were brought up, like that, that is a part of it. And, and, right, God is God. And so I think that there is, even in, when you think about the earth sea tradition, where this comes from, there's this notion of God being changed. And if God shapes the universe, we shape God and this idea of partnership, which can be really beautiful, but also really terrifying because you're thinking about the notion of it. But God is still God, even in, even in, in that notion, right? There is this, yep. this this holy otherness that is still a part of even the idea of the shaping. So I think that um, you're right. It is a scary and terrifying notion of our ability to shape God. And it could result in some crazy atrocities that it has resulted in, right? You're not saying anything that hasn't already happened. Mm -hmm. And 
So we wrestle with that a lot. Yeah. Thanks. Of course. Other questions, comments, push back. Pushing back is fun. It's real fun. Love that part. We don't have time to play the game, I don't think, because we would need at least a good 20 minutes to play. I was curious about the comment that um, Joan put in the in the chat. The title is Afrofuturism, but it sounds like it's not Africa, but African diaspora based in response to racism. I was just really curious about that. Oh, I, I didn't even want to say anymore. Yes. Yeah. So Afrofuturism isn't isn't uh, necessarily about the African um continent and there is also a lot of distinctions in the use of this term so african afrofuturism was coined in the states in relation to african americans um, and their responses um that's also complicated because you have people who are from the continent of africa they were living in america at the time and were incorporating a lot of these different things you also have writers like nikki or akorafor who uses the term african futurism to denote a distinction between Afrofuturism in the States and a particularity in African futurism um, on the continent of Africa. You have all of these different Caribbean futurisms, like all these different contexts to try to name the distinctiveness. It's also pushing back against a certain way in which Black culture is dominated by the US um, and diversifying, right? Not creating a monolith, right? Um, but overall, you do have the term Afrofuturism to think about the concept of um, black art and creativity as creating a future in the uses of technology. So even now you have animated series on like Disney Plus that are um, coming out, some incredible stuff is coming out of Nigeria right now. Um, mm -hmm. And they're working with Disney Plus and doing all these great animated things that they're still categorizing as Afrofuturism. Um, so it's varied um, and very, it's different depending on who you talk to. But there, there have been some name distinctions. But Afrofuturism um, started here in the States. Thanks for uh, the question. I didn't even see that in the chat. Now I got to go back and see if there are any more questions. That's the only one I saw. But... Okay, great. Thank you. Appreciate that. And we're also drawing close to our end time, Tamisha. So, um, I didn't know if you wanted to have a final thought to be able to wrap this all together for us. Before you do that, I will share that Tamisha has agreed to stay after if people want to chat with her for, you know, three or five minutes more. Um, and I'm grateful for that. Thank you. Um, but I'd like to make sure you have a chance to, to kind of draw this in the way that you'd like to draw it to a close. Yeah. Thank you so much. I mean, this has been super great. Y'all have been awesome. Um, just to note that there is such a variety and beautiful um, way of both creating and dreaming in the concept of Afrofuturism. And I think that the way in which they dream, the way in which Afrofuturists push toward a better future is, is um, an example of how we can within our own religious context, right? Within our own church context. Um, and may it be both an inspiration and also a challenge to you and to, to think about the central question of the course is what current conditions must change in order for a future or a world in which Black people are citrated and thriving exist? If those conditions don't exist in your current world, what responsibility do you have to change that so that that world is possible? Mm -hmm. That's yeah. all. And also, Thanks. take classes. Take classes. <laughs> <laughs> that's a strong call thank you so much we appreciate you coming and sharing with us congratulations on your new appointment to bethany mm -hmm. and so we will look forward to seeing more of you in the months and years to come definitely this was so much fun next time definitely have to do three hours now, now i know <laughs> good good Thank you, friends. This concludes our course for this evening. Feel free to uh, be on your way, but if you'd like to stay for a few more minutes, feel free to stay and chat as well.